Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse and DC Toon Time is back. We are talking Grand Funk. This is episode six. We are looking at the Red Album, ladies and gentlemen, so let's get started. Talking band no one talks about. Grant's Rock Warehouse. Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and we are live. And I've got DC Toon Time in the in the uh, co-host chair. We are at number six in our Grand Funk series. Now, DC and I have talked about this before. It's hard to believe we're doing six episodes of this, but what the hell? We're we're on episode six, and there's been a lot of uh, people saying, "When are you going to do that Red album? When are you going to do the Red album?" Well, ladies and gentlemen. That day is here. So I want to thank DC for coming on. We're going to have a general discussion about this. Uh, but first, I want to look at some comments because we've had a lot of comments already. Um, Sweet FA24, he gives a middle finger salute to the Rock Hall for even cons not considering Grand Funk. They've never been nominated, have they, DC? Nope. Not even got a whiff of any kind of interest in the Hall of Fame. It's just, uh, it's criminal, in my opinion. Of course, Logan's right on with that. Um, nice to see everybody in the chat. Hey, this is going to be fun. Prog Rock Dude, Logan, nice to see you. Ken, nice to see you. Um, yeah, last night, Prog Rock <laughs> Dude, you missed it because Jamie Laszlo and I did a, a show on douche rock. Now, Jamie thought he came up with the term. I saw the term pop up like 11, 10 years ago, but who knew that Pete Pardo was going to join that show? It was incredible. It was incredible. But uh, everybody we had, brought their A game. It was spontaneous. And the commentary from the folks watching and the people that were on the panel, it was just like that. one of those amazing Moments where the confluence of everybody participating was pow through the roof. Right. It was hilarious. Well, that's the beauty of doing a live show. You never know. It's a totally different vibe. And the fact that you know people are tuning in and people are interacting with you as you're presenting this material mm -hmm. just, I mean, it energizes me. There, I feel differently doing these shows than when we record something to be put up later. So. Right. Looking yeah, forward to fun. already had it outstanding great. comments already. We haven't even started. You know what? It, it, the funny thing that no one even mentioned Grand Funk as being part of the douche rock. Uh, I did. Thing. I did. I left a comment up there because I said the treatment that Nickelback gets mm -hmm. is similar to what Grand Funk used to get in the 70s. It was yeah. like there was always a band that the music intelligentsia liked the crap on. And back in the 70s, it was Grand Funk, and now it's Nickelback. So, so but everyone's here. Ernesto's here. Hey, hey Ernesto. It's right here, Ernesto, for God's Sweet. sakes. Gary Joyce is here. Gary. Of course, Ken is here. Everybody, hey. Kyle's here. Kyle's My here. My goodness gracious. So, all the heavy hitters. All the heavy hitters. And I knew God this God. red album would get everybody if they possibly could make it to make it. Right. This, uh, uh so, some may have been clamoring for us to get to this album. And for a lot of the Grand Funk, longtime Grand Funk fans um, of the early days, this is their favorite album. Not mine. Mm -hmm. Mine is still E Pluribus Funk. But this is a very fine album, too, in my opinion. And mine's still shining on. I think that's brilliant. Well, I, I put that in a whole other category. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about this one because this is the second album that came out in 1970. This record came out in January of 70, so it's damn near it's still almost in the 60s, but let's be honest. If anything that came out in 1970 is still the 60s. Sure. Really, you know. Um because if you listen to this, this damn thing sounds dated like you wouldn't believe. You know, to me I agree and this is a this is a little fun little bit of information here that I parsed through as I was reacquainting myself with this album. This album sounds a little bit old. And I also thought of an album that's only one year younger than this, Alice Cooper's Killer. Mm -hmm. That album sounds as fresh in 2024 as it did in 1971. Whereas this album sounds a little dated as much as I love it. 
it's a little dated. It's a little dated, but we also had Bob Ezrin on Killer, so that helps. And the boys Don't, just had Terry Knight. So well, and Terry Knight, if you ever listened to Mark Farner or uh, Dom Brewer talk about, it, I think it was Mark Farner in some interview. I don't know where it was, but Mark said basically they were producing themselves. They weren't. Terry was taking a back seat. He just made sure everything was running. Terry was a fantastic promoter but not necessarily in the producer's chair what this band needed. And Todd said the same thing when he finally got his hands on them. Yeah. Very fine musicians. They just were never produced correctly in the studio. Exactly. Now I'm seeing some commentaries going along the side of my page here. with something about Grand Douche Railroad from Kyle. Yeah, Grand Douche Railroad. Well, come on, think about it. Come on, Kyle, come on. Think about the critical acclaim. Think about this band back in the early, late 60s, early 70s. Well, I always bring up Rolling Stone, but Rolling Stone hated these guys. The critics hated Grand Funk. Because Grand Funk stepped around their control of the music industry and what was cool and what should be popular and what everybody should like. They went right around the music intelligentsia, flipped them the bird, and this was a band of the people. So there, that's why the critics have always hated them. So Ken, is Cleveland Recording Company still around or is it defunct? I don't know, but they did. But I will say this about the Red Album. Before we get into it, I'm going to turn it over to DC to start us off. But this record really does sound good. Because think about it, you've got a three-piece band. It's very simple. There's really not much. I don't. I can't really hear any overdubs on this thing. It just seems like, all right, Grand Funk, let's wind you up and let you go, and we'll record it. <laughs> that's what I hear, and I'm yeah. not saying that's good or bad. Um, it's, a, it's just so electric for a studio album. Really comes across. Look at that album cover. You know, that's one that Nana's not going to like when you put it on if she happens to come over this thing rocks hard and for you grant <laughs> yes having a problem with the live album and the the Ooh. fuzz tone on mel's bass that's not here. apparent here in these studios. oh yes songs. it is yes it you is. think it is not in the okay because okay. to my ears it's not oh, as whoop, much whoop. but oh it's you're there. the bass player this is like the live album without audience noise to me <laughs> Yeah. But we'll get to that. Okay. So, uh, Kyle was only kidding about the douche rock, but no, think about <laughs> it. You take a time machine back and invent that douche rock term. Let's say we take Jamie back to 1970. Mm-hmm. He's got let's his headband say, on. And let's say, Dana. yeah, let's say Jamie invented that. Grand Funk would be douche rock. Of course it would. They're not much different than lit or whatever that one band 182 whatever that what is Blink that 182 Blink 182 all that crap it's all the yeah. same but and i'm then, not saying that i'm right. we're gonna look at it logan says rolling stone don't know jack well you got that right logan man i kicked rolling stone to the curb when i was like 14 years old clowns if they didn't like something i went right out and bought it see look logan's all upset grant grant grant, grant. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start it. I'm going to turn it over to DC. We're All going right. to go through the album a bit. Then we'll go and give our rating at the end. And just like we did the other episodes. Okay. So we'll see. Everybody knows my stance on Grand Funk. Right. And you know, I like later Grand The later, the better. Well, to a degree. To a degree. As, if it's got Todd Rundgren involved, I'm good. I could okay. definitely think of one of those 70s bands that would absolutely fit this label, but I don't know if I want to have that <laughs> conservation. Prog rock. Dude. Dude. Who? You can tell us. No one's yeah, going to no, no, hold us in suspense. If someone gives you shit in the comments, I'll delete it. Feel yeah, free to talk we'll about it. all friends. Um, anyway, thing, PC, let's start you okay. off. Start us off. Now, like I said, for many of the early Grand Funk fans that have been here for the full ride when the band hit the scene, this Red album holds a special place and is the favorite for many 
longtime Grand Funk fans. As I've said, of the early years, I prefer the E Pluribus Funk album. But this is very good. And when I revisited leading up to prepare to this show, um, it really struck me that these guys really worked it in the fact that they were a three-piece band. You got guitar, bass, drums, and trying to keep things interesting within that. And that's not easy. I mean, changing tempos, letting different instruments, and a male in a lot of instances almost being a lead guitar. Um, they really took care to make their songs interesting and add some variety in there because it was a three piece. Um, I think I was going to mention about the bass not being as overwhelming, but I guess my ears have failed me on that front. No, I listen to this and all I hear is Mel and his distorted mm. bass. And I'm going, oh my God. But I mean, the tempo. Tempo changes that they do, the uh, Mark switching off from guitar to keys, the harmonica, Mel coming forward with the bass lines. Um, they re really made the most of a combo of three. Mm -hmm. We still don't get very much Don Brewer on vocals here. In fact, no lead vocals for Don, sadly. Yeah, right. and that's what I like. I like Don. And there's mm -hmm. very little Don other than maybe some backgrounds. This is the Mark Farner foot yes, stomp show, case. ladies and gentlemen. Showcase it's, for Mark. It's a show, showcase for Mark. Um, okay, we can look at the songs and I'll yeah. give you my Go ahead. two cents worth. And Grant, you could chime in and I tell will. me where I'm wrong. No, no. Okay. I have to calm down on this episode <laughs> because I don't want... Craig Frost. We miss Craig Frost on this. Yeah. Um, I, there's, there'll be one song in particular I'll bring up a little bit okay. about Craig Frost. But here. Craig, I think, was great. I think when they brought Craig in, that was a game changer. When he came in on Phoenix, it was they like needed to. fresh air, I think. They had gone as far as they could as a threesome, mix things up as best they could, and still be able to perform most of these songs in a live setting. But they that's as far as they can go. So they needed to add another guitarist or a keyboard player. Yeah. But uh, let's look at uh, first song side one. Yeah. Got this thing on the move and man, this just kicks right from the get go with that rip roar and start. Dare I say a foot stomping <laughs> guitar riff from Mark. Uh, and the yeah. second riff that follows in that song is even more kick ass than the first one. And at one part, part, you know, point in the song, the guitar pulls away and Mel takes over with a really driving bass line behind Mark's vocals. And they build with a crescendo and Don's drums pound out a deliberate rhythm while Mark plays lead. And this is what I mean by them changing tempo slightly within a song and switching off their approach to keep things interesting with a three piece. Mm -hmm. You got to be inventive. You know, you're not filling with the second um, backup musical instrument uh, like keys that could switch off. You got to be really inventive within a three person, um, three piece band. So I think this, the album kicks off spectacularly. Let mm -hmm. you know what this album is all about. So I don't well, know, I know because the whole record sounds like the first track. <laughs> they could have ended it right there and as we as could, I, have, we we could have saved a lot of vinyl if <laughs> the single put out got this thing on the move and then put don't please don't worry on the flip and call it a day <laughs> you're good we would have saved a lot of vinyl <laughs> wait a minute, yeah, wait a minute. Like i hung on to a gibson eb2 because it had kind of sound that mel's bass had well yeah, but you had like that big mud bucker neck. I don't know how Mel pulled this off on a precision, but he did. We need paranoid and inside looking out. They were a long time in their live acts. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Look, Logan's um, giving me another grant, grant, grant. <laughs> what Ken was pointing out. Um, and I'll reiterate Go here. ahead. Go ahead. The, those three songs that are on this album that also appear on that first live album, mm -hmm. I never go to the versions on this album if I want to listen to those. For me, those live versions completely outstrip 
the studio versions of these songs. So right there, there's three songs on this album that I prefer on the live set much more than here. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. That is a sacrilege. He is a douche. Uh, what I, I hear. Disagree. I don't know. I'm just going with what people are telling uh, me. I've, I've had enough interactions, not personally, with Farner to know that he is not a douche. Okay. But hey, you may have run into him at the feed store or something. and <laughs> The feed store when he's getting <laughs> feed. He lives up in the wilderness. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, Record collector, that was funny. I appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, GC. I, sorry to okay. interrupt, but you know we are live and we are just kind of we're just letting the conversation go. We're folks. letting it go. Please keep the comments coming. We love this. Um, the second tune, please don't worry. It starts with like this jazzy riff, and then it settles into kind of like a bluesy tune. And uh, Mark and Don do share vocals on the chorus back and forth. <laughs> Agreed, Logan. Agreed. I don't think Definitely Don. I don't know what's going on with Mel. I can't. I don't think it. Don's douchey. Don's the man. Anyway, uh, go ahead. Uh, well, we won't get into those weeds at this point. Um, there's really nice lead work by Mark on uh, this. Please don't worry. Um, Mark is the right guitarist for this band. I mean, everybody talks about your pages and Blackmores and. Yeah, we get all that. But for this band, Mark Farner was the right guitarist. Um, well, I will say that as far as guitar playing goes, I think his playing on this record is much better within the studio confines as opposed to him playing live. I wasn't impressed with all what he was doing live on the live record, but I, I think I, he yeah, sounds pretty think, good on this record as a player and what he contributes and i think that live album what you're hearing it's of its time with all the extended song versions and plus you don't have the visuals of mark as a front man playing that shirtless stuff. shirtless as he is on the cover here and you can look down on the right corner yeah. there folks fart fart mark without his shirt without a shirt back bending back guitar what a showman what yeah, a, he's showman. a fantastic showman, I think. Um, well, we can move on to song number three, High yeah, Pollute right. Woman. Uh, this is a swanky boogie type song, and it's good for what it is. Um, uh, I would like to see the concert chicks back in the day dancing to this one with their halters and tube tops. <laughs> And Mark switches. And switches Mark putting up. on his blouse. <laughs> Mark switches up from guitar to piano on this one. It sounds like one of those kids' toy pianos. Yeah. Um, they couldn't pull this off live because you would need Mr. Craig Frost to come in there and play because the guitar is still going at that point in the song when the keyboards come in. So right there, there may have been the seeds of, if we wanted to do this live, we couldn't. Because Mark wouldn't just switch off. Mm -hmm. We need both instruments playing at the same time. So yeah. maybe the seeds of a fourth member were planted on a high flute and woman. I don't know. Oh, I wouldn't doubt that at all. <laughs> it what took are your a thoughts long about while. the sound of that uh, that piano on this? I think it's lovely. It's one of the okay. best keyboard <laughs> pianos. It reminds me of those heard. toy pianos a little bit. But it's kind of questionable, but uh <laughs> Hey, the uh, the variety. I don't mind when Mark goes over and plays keyboards. I don't either. And and when he switches off, I think it's like it's what I'm saying. These guys within a threesome mm -hmm. found ways to keep things interesting within a concert setting with an amount of songs or even within a songs keeping things interesting. Yeah, I agree. I don't really, you know, might have kind of a rinky dink sound, but I think maybe that's what they might have been going for. Yeah. I'm I sure don't know. Probably. I haven't read anything about it, but hey, it's effective. It works. I don't have a problem with it. Mm hmm. Uh, now we get number four, and it's Mr. Limousine Driver. Mm -hmm. That's a really catchy riff by Mark. Mm -hmm. He's singing about all the hassles, folks, 
of mm. catching a limo after the show yeah, when horrible. you also want to entertain a hot groupie in the back seat. And I'm sure we can all identify with Mark's plight here, can't we? Are you saying that Mark wanted to get laid? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> He's probably already sitting back there with his shirt off, right, Grant? Just waiting to wait open that to limousine back to, door uh, for whatever tube top plant his seed catches eye. There. Plant his seed. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, wait a minute. Ken's got a good point. We had Iggy Pop shirtless <laughs> probably before Mark. Must have been something in the water in the Detroit area. Yeah, yeah why are all these guys? Shirt? Did Ted take off his shirt yet? Because he got took his shirt off later. Yeah, I don't know with Amboy Dukes what the deal was. Maybe he was wearing like a fur vest. And Mark a lot of times would wear a vest, but these guys are all from Detroit. What was in the water up there? Well, this sounds like a show developing. What <laughs> shirtless? Did, why are all the Detroit bands yeah, shirtless? shirtless. Bad Olivia it's a good John question. From it's Detroit. a good question. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Next, we get to one of the songs that's on this album that also appears on the live album, In Need. Mm. Um, it's a great tune. Like I said, I prefer the version on the live album. Now we're starting to get into the extended jam songs portion of the album. With this thing clocking in at about eight minutes. Uh, but Mark goes from guitar to harmonica and gives Mel and Don a chance to shine. Hmm. And this clearly is a tune of its time. Yes. A few extended jams were the norm back in the day, young people. They were expected <laughs> and people dug them. Uh, but now they can sound a little dated to modern ears. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I made my comparisons between the way this album was put together the way it was put together and the songs themselves and something like Alice Cooper's killer that came a year later, that to me sounds like it could have been recorded yesterday. This album sounds like it came out of 1969 or 1970. Well, it did. Yeah. And I still like it, but it's funny how some music or some albums over the course of time, it doesn't get dated. Mm -hmm. And others, it's like, oh, my God, that is clearly 1970 or clearly 1982 or whatever. Well, no, prog rock, dude. No, these guys are not the Grateful Dead. They, God, these, no. No. No, no, not Fish or the Grateful Dead. But there were extended concert uh, type tunes that you would stretch out. Even if it wasn't that long on the album, you would pick a song or two to do an extended version live. But Don could play. You could put Don in the Grateful Dead and he would smoke. Oh, on that. yeah. I mean, he's a brilliant drummer. You know, and I've brought this up in one of our older shows is that Don Brewer really could get more uh, kudos because really his work. Look at the his work on here. He smokes. Well, he smokes on all of He's a stuff. great drummer, and great his drummer. approach to drumming, I can't compare anybody in the rock realm that plays the way Brewer plays. He makes a lot more use of his cymbals than most mm -hmm. in the hi-hat, to my ears. Like, I was Brewer. a guitarist. I wasn't a drummer, but from what I can hear, that Brewer was part could of his have, approach. Brewer could have been in Cream. He's every bit as good as Ginger Baker. He could have been in with Hendrix easy. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. With all, all the headaches that Ginger Baker brought. <laughs> yeah. Who needs Ginger Baker for God's sake? Mess. But Brewer, as a percussionist, a drummer, I think is absolutely brilliant. Every time you listen to his songs, you any of these tracks, you go, God, that's a good, that's good fill right there. He's great. I'll absolutely. Yeah. So we're saluting you, Don Brewer, if you're well, out I, there somewhere. Of course. Um, let's see. The next tune on the album track six is winter and my soul. And this song almost starts out as a country sounding song. Don't you think? Yeah. It sounds like a country song and may be the precursor 
to what they did on the Phoenix album when they went to Nashville and recorded a whole album that's got country flavor interspersed there within the songs. Well, I think at least on Phoenix, I think it translates better. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I hear the country in this song as it starts out. It's a mid-tempo tune. And it also goes into a jazz passage again for a bit. And then abruptly abruptly accelerates the tempo to finish out. Um, Again, the boys are keeping it interesting. Yeah. But uh, it's a very different song from everything else on the album here. Like I say, I've really noticed a country flavor to this one. Yeah, I agree. And okay, number seven. Paranoid. We got paranoid. Not the Sabbath Paranoid. That came out a year later. So Grand Funk beat him uh, in the first song about this subject. And it start this the um the version on the live album, of course, doesn't have all the opening gobbledygook because it starts with a bunch of TV and radio chatter and then news commentary about all the troubles of the days and such. And then we hear sirens and we hear some automobiles laying on the brakes and screeching and everything. Yikes. Yeah, yikes. Um, this song, Mark's guitar has got all kind of fuzz and wah-wah on it. Yeah, it's kind of droney and spooky <laughs> and searing in parts. <laughs> Wait a minute. Farmer's wall sounds like a damn jaguar. Compared, <laughs> like a jaguar in heat? What are you saying, Logan? He's got the fuzz and the Wawa going big time. I mean, it's kind of annoying, but then you also yeah. have the fuzz on uh on on the bass, and that drives me crazy because I don't why are we cranking shit so loud that you have to have fuzz bass? I don't know. That may be the one misstep with them having a three piece and wanting to just project so much sound and music that they went a little overboard with some of the uh, extras that they added to guitar and bass. I just because- think that they, based on the way I hear this record and the live album, no on the equipment that they had at the time. I just think that they were playing very loudly in the studio and live because I think just the amount of distortion coming out of the bass amp is just incredible. Oh, yeah. They they, uh, they put out a, a ton of sound. In fact, I think Rod Stewart in the day called them the great white noise. <laughs> I, Grumpa, I think that fuzz bass is annoying. Unless it's like a little Bernie fuzz bass doing it, then he knows how to do it. But I don't dig what Mel's doing. Yeah. Back Drives in the day, I, I loved my combo fuzz Wawa pedal. Fuzz and Wawa. Yeah, Kyle, love it. And to the uninitiated, you play an electric guitar, but then you plug in your fuzz and Wawa, and you appear to be 10 times better. To the uninitiated. And everybody in the chat, bless you for chiming in. If you dig it, I'm good with it. Me, I'm much more of a purist. Yes. And, you know, that we fuzz bass just doesn't, unless Getty Lee's doing it or Chris Squire, those guys know how to do it. Mal, not so much. It's just kind of, it just dates it. That's all. Would you, would you say if you're going to do that, you got to be a little bit more nimble with your bass patterns? And not as droning. Well, I wouldn't use a P bass. I wouldn't use that. There you I go. Hey, we're, get, we're getting into some inside baseball here, folks. With the, <laughs> I'm just saying, it, it, yeah, it was 1970. It's 1969. You know what I mean? Oh, for God's sake, Logan! Oh, oh, I saw Pure that. Purist equals Boy George fan. Oh. Purist from a beef heart. Look at this. I knew I'd set the internet on fire. <laughs> I like fuzz bass on Stoner Rock. All right, that's fair now. Elder, there's fuzz bass and there's distorted bass. Very good point. This is fuzz bass. I should make the, I should be clearer what I'm talking about. I'm not a fan of fuzz bass unless Paul McCartney's do it, doing it in 1965. But there's overdriven bass that Chris Squire and 
Getty Lee perfected. This I don't hear here. What? <laughs> Elder of Rock. Lemmy had the ultimate distorted bass. There is no, but you couldn't pick anything out of Lemmy. Nothing against Lemmy. That was the whole <laughs> band. There was no, everything just sounded like uh, uh, noise. Mm, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No offense. I'm surprised, you like I'm surprised it? Marlon isn't double teaming you with Logan about the boy yeah, George. Marlon, stuff. Marlon's not here. He must. Does, Logan thinks Marlon hates me or something now, and I it could be. <laughs> um, you like what you like. I yeah. get it. But the elder, I would agree that Lemmy had the ultimate distorted bass. You are a hundred percent. Yeah, Motorhead. Yeah, right in your face. <laughs> so you can't say anything in passing on this channel because if you just say one little weird thing it's retained it's retained logan will throw up boy Look george fan beefheart fan and they throw it back in your face like i said grant thank god marlon's not here because he'd be throwing all kinds of crap your way with soft sell and who knows what else yeah, uh probably debbie gibson for god's sake <laughs> uh Elder of Rock, everything louder than everything else. Yes. <laughs> Motorhead was the loudest band in the world. Makes It does. Kyle, 100%. Motorhead had their thing, and I'm not taking anything away from it. That first Motorhead album, you have to admit, is a classic. Um, I read that Fast Eddie switched from a Gibson to start just to cut through Lemmy's bass. I believe it. But if I'm going to listen, I'd rather listen to that fast way record. And when I'm listening to fast Eddie, that fat, that first fast way Say album you will. is great. Oh, you yes, have to sir. admit. Ken, Ken White. White. <laughs> Marlon, Marlon doesn't like anything. I, Truth be too, told, I don't know Marlon what he's doing. The biggest curmudgeon in the warehouse. Marlon's probably cleaning it. his, he's probably washing his dentures in the sink tonight. <laughs> He's probably busy. I wish Marlon was here. I really need his input. <laughs> we sorely miss you, Marlon. We do. You are, you, Fastway is killer. Yes. Fastway fucking ruled. I agree. Yep. Grandpa Marlon. I love Marlon. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I wish he was here tonight. Yeah. I well, love this bullshit that he's going to contribute. Marlon only likes a salt attack. Nothing don't bring, else. Don't bring anything remotely soft to the conversation because Marlon will shoot you down like right like that. Right. But it's funny. He doesn't mean it ill-mannered. No. He's, he's passionate, and we love that. Right. Everybody is passionate about music that Elder year. of Rock, the second Fastway wasn't too bad. I'm just thinking maybe we'll do a Fastway show because those records probably could – I think we could look at those again. Anyway, yeah, put that on the ladies board. and gentlemen. We're on a tangent again, <laughs> but this is why we do leave these live shows. It's we, fun. We're shooting. We let shit. the conversation go right. where it goes. So, DC, we talked about paranoid. What last track? Inside looking out. Any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, I mean, and to finish off with paranoid. If you're not prepared for that baby crying at the end of the song, you just might right. poop your pants a little bit. Like you think the song's over and this baby just starts wailing at the end of the song. It's like, Pow! Yeah. Took me by surprise. But uh, inside looking out, of course, this is that uh, old Eric Burden and the Animals tune. But Grand Funk makes it their own. Note to self, don't play Marlon any Oh, do that, do <laughs> no, don't play Marlon dude. any Simon and Garfunkel. Dude. Oh, no. Somebody trick or in treat, the front trick office. Or treat. And... Another good one. We need to look at Fastway, I think, because I go. think no one talks Fastway. So there. Nope. All anyway, right, keep going. Sorry. Okay. Getting back to Inside Looking Out. This was an Eric Burden tune that Grand Funk made their own. The Eric Burden version pales. Pales, he said, in comparison. Mm -hmm. Far out strips the original. And I have to say, Grand Funk was really good at picking cover tunes and putting their stamp on them. Now, from Survival, they did Gimme Shelter. Mm -hmm. That is a fine version of that song. And it's, you, 
Well, let me then ask take, you about that real quick. You mentioned Gibby sure. Shelter. How do you compare that to the original version? Do you think that Grand Funk, we just, I just did a show with John the Music Nut where we looked at right. Little Ronstadt and we're talking about Simple Dreams. We're talking mm-hmm. about that 1977 album. And on that record, just, I know we're not talking Linda Ronstadt, but it's on my mind. Sure. She was able to take like a lot of these Warren Zevon songs and totally make them her own. Mm-hmm. Now, on the previous record, we didn't find that so much. But do you think that Grand Funk was able to take Gimme Shelter and totally make it their own? I mean, that's quite a statement. Well, do you think they, put, they were they, they put their on they put their stamp on it, and it's clearly a different version of the song. I won't it would never say it was better than the Stones version. Well, I don't it's think I can say that. I, of it's their stamp where it's inside looking out. I can say that is clearly a better version than the Eric Burden version. Okay. Well, um, like with the Linda Ronstadt stuff, when she would do Warren Zevon, I'm not necessarily saying it's better, but I think some of those versions that she would do and the buddy, I can't think, uh, was it that'll be the day? That'll be the day. Uh, I think people tend to think that that's the best version, and people kind of forget the Buddy Holly version. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I'm saying. And I think that when she yeah. did like Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me, yeah, probably music people really know that that was a Warren Z- Zevon song, sure. but she does make it their own. And I think a lot of people think that that's the version to go to. Yeah. And to you know, casual, funk, it could be the same kind of thing. To I'm the casual wondering. listener or the younger listener, they would have no idea of that. Linda Ronstadt cover was a buddy Holly tune. Just saying, because people take their time on this planet as all the music that they really pursue. They might not even known it was a buddy Holly song. Yeah. But there is a talent to taking somebody else's material and recording it away for the masses or recording it away where it seems like it's more accessible to more people. Mm-hmm. Like Three Dog Night made a career of it. Those guys never wrote any of their songs, but they were so gifted in picking tunes. P-Pardo. All right, all right Pete Pardo, game on. <laughs> Get them on. on if you want to come up, Pete. <laughs> Well, you know, I know. <laughs> no, I think we need that to be a separate show. Um, so like I said, with Book it, inside Pardo, looking Book out, it. um, this song they throw everything in but the kitchen sink on this. Mm-hmm. And as I say in almost every show I do here with Grant, when we're done here, folks, and only when we're done here, go on to YouTube and look for Grand Funk Railroad's performance of Inside Looking Out in this TV studio back in '69. You will be astounded at the performance. It's uh, a real tour de force, and you can see the real synergy and interplay between the three players. But look it up when we're done here, and uh, you can take it to the bank. Well, like prog rock, dude. Think about Linda Ronstadt's version of Blue Bayou. I keep bringing up Linda only because I just did a damn show on it. But when you think, listen, listen to Blue Bayou, that's a Roy Orbison song, but who really identifies that with Roy? Agree. Barely anybody identify <laughs> it with Linda anymore, but I'm just saying. Right. But when you hear Blue Bayou in my monkey brain, I think Linda Ronstadt. Of course. You have Is to that your it. life experience? That was when you were paying attention to music. That's what came across your radio. And right. of course, it's going to resonate in your heart. Oh my God, look at this. Guess who's here, DC? The good doctor. The good doctor, Funkenstein. Hello, there he is. Doctor. Look at that, Gary Joyce. Pete, the, of course he's the, of course. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is another good point. I know we're on a tangent. Hell, so many people to this day thinks Jimi Hendrix wrote all along the Watchtower. But if Folks. that's a good point. There, I'm sure Pete's probably done a show on it about artists and bands that have done remakes and have totally hit it out of the park. And this right. is when you're thinking all along the watchtower, no one wants to hear the Dylan version. No. Tangled so, up in blue. Yeah, That's something saying. that me and Pete agree on. Yeah. Dylan, great songwriter. You're never going to win me over as a performer. 
Oh, the grand oh, funk grand show grand. on SOT is going to happen. I can guarantee yeah. you. Um, <laughs> Pete tried to <laughs> hoard his way on again, the elder. That's funny. No, uh, he, he doesn't need any help. That's a good, that's funny though. Um, let me look. But people, anyway, go uh, ahead. In Sorry, we're on a tangent. Comments, folks. You all know that we are a very small subset of the general population. Right. Number one, for people to be as passionate about music as we are, look in your life. How many other people do you know that are as passionate as you? If you're lucky, you have one or two other friends that love music the way we do. People don't pursue this stuff. They don't even care who originally wrote the song. If they recorded it in their minds, they wrote it. That's as far as it goes. Right. I mean, when I think of the Rolodex of the people in my life currently, there's nobody that I interact with on a daily or weekly or monthly basis that loves music and gets into the minutia of it like I do. My wife loves music, but she's, you know, she's not going to tell you, oh, so-and-so wrote that, but they didn't record it or whatever. My We're a very working. small subset, folks. My thing, oh, there they're working. God darn, there I thought go. we had a problem. Um, the good doctor owns no grand funk. He probably blushed to explore. Well, you yeah. should see our other, sh all right, good doctor. I know you're back in the in the show thing now. These, this is part six of DC. We've done six shows on Grand Funk. Before you start out, go and review those shows that we've already done because I think, uh, I'm not sure if this is really the record you want to start out with. Young Logan may think so. Pete Pardo may think so. <laughs> but me, look at the Todd Rundgren stuff first. That's where I'm going to go with. So, yeah, I know uh, Dr. Funkenstein obviously loves the funk. And the true funk and grand funk railroad. I mean, I hear some of it in, on Shine and On. Maybe that's where he wants to start his musical crusade. See, we're we're like doing a show off a show now. Judas Priest, Green Man, Alishi. Though I love the uh, Fleetwood Mac version, but did Judas Priest make this? Yes. I but think the... it brings the power and the grit much more than the Fleetwood Mac version did. And it seems to suit the actual song better. I will say. There you go. Ken white, bring it in. Joni Mitchell wrote Woodstock CSNY was good, but Matthew Southern Kupner was the best. And I disagree. I still think CSN and Y's version is perfect, but you know, Ken, I don't, I'm not worried. I can, I can, you know, take your comment and, disregarded i'm afraid of marlin you i'm not as afraid of so i'm all right you know slamming you a bit grant i think just you joking. or i or both of us were just labeled a monkey brain clown by young logan well he's <laughs> young and i am a monkey brain clown <laughs> anyway have, to have a little talk with him tomorrow morning before Prog rock dude same thing with black magic woman yeah you oh, look at that santana songs. version fucking yeah. kills it yeah, you can even take Grand Funk with with uh, the locomotion. There are people that think that that's a Grand Funk song, and a lot of it depends on your age, you know. Yeah. But it's it is what it is. I, I may be one of you Grand Funk fans. Okay, go ahead, who read it. Go ahead, and read are, it. Who like their '80s albums? Grand Funk Lives is pretty decent. What's Funk is definitely a product of his time. However. Life in Outer Space is one of their best. What do you think uh, of the, I got the it, Zappa George, I got record, George? Away there. Grand Funk Lives is the better of the two 80 albums, but that What's Funk album. <laughs> no. There are maybe only two songs on that that I. Does that mean we album. should look at What's Funk next? Well, I think we should just package those two 80 albums as one show. I don't think they deserve well, separate. I commentary i think me. we're gonna look at the zap album next anyway so yeah i got a list of what we've covered and what we haven't covered all right trusty Brad yeah ken i was just give i just running the up you know i love you i'm just it's all in good fun <laughs> but i am scared of marlon i really am 
You never I, know. Marlon could go off. You don't know what he'll do. It, well, sensitive. Yeah, you got to watch. You, you got to watch, watch your back. Thank no God. No soft rock back in the warehouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Star tried to put on some top 40 to a station Look, and Logan digs his it. Logan digs his track. He likes his record. All right. See, it's, we all hear lives, everything. Liv's album has probably got half of it is very good, and the other half of it, it's just not the grand funk that I love. All right. And then the second 1980s album. The only thing I really like about that is the lady in the bathing suit with the jumper cables on the cover. Hey, you know, and there is something about women. With jumper cables. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's a thing, isn't it? Well, it could be. <laughs> Grand Funk's version of Giddy Shoulder has an angry vibe to it, while the Great, Stones Brian. version seems somber. Interesting. That's yeah. That is, a, you, that is a very interesting point, Brian. Hats off to you, man. That's that's God exactly. God. These people that watch this damn show are smart. We got the we got the best viewers. Well. Pete's got a solid cast too and the contrarians, but we've got a good group of folks that tune into these shows and very astute Mm -hmm. observations. So anyway, all right, before I give my thoughts on it, I do want to hear your synopsis at the end. So uh, DC, I'm going to, what is your whole thoughts on this record and what would you rate it? This album has lots of tunes. I really like, I would say half of them, iPod worthy. Three of them I like better live than these versions. Overall, I would give this album 8.5 only because in some ways in my 19 in my 2024 mind it sounds <laughs> very dated to me. Right. Whereas like we pointed out, there are other albums of this era that do not sound dated. And that's a little bit of a strike against it. But I still think it brings the grit and power of Grand Funk. And I would put it up there as one of the better earlier albums. Like E Pluribus is number one for me. Red, maybe number two. And we're not counting the live album because that's probably one of my well, that's a- favorite live album in my music listening oh, history is and that that live, that live album is like needle pricks on the brain for me <laughs> it's just like too much because it doesn't stop it's the just pro- it just goes goes um, goes now if you listen to that album and break it up into sections it's just it just pummels you it pummels it doesn't let up, I'm Grant. tired i'm tired i know it could be exhausting all right so this record i look at it now, everyone knows this is not the era that I'm really fans of. And this there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of mark. And I think, like I've said before, Grand Funk strengths lie in a balance of all the band members. I need more Don Brewer here. I need mm-hmm. more of his vocals. I need more of his lead vocals. When they eventually start trading off they bring a lot more Don in. It just makes a better blend. This has got so much Mark Farner in it. It makes me want to jump out of a window. <laughs> now, not as bad as the, the live album, yeah. but. I, I hear you. And like I said, when they brought Don to the fore, and you'll see that in subsequent albums, as we get past the red album through to <clears throat> the rendering years, there's more Don, and then Don really becomes a prominent player once Todd's behind the dials. Right. But yes, when we incorporate more of the Don vocals, man, for a band to have those two dynamic vocalists in one band that could trade off, wow, fantastic. Um, George Matthews got a really good comment here. Um, <laughs> Wait, no, Logan's got a better Grant Brewer. Grant Brewer. Yeah, well, <laughs> I like what I like, young Logan. Anyway, what did he? Which one? Uh, the top one that's a little bit more wordy. This. Okay. Yes, Grant, yes, Grant Funk. Funk. Go ahead. Um, you read it. You read it. Yeah. Yes, Grant Funk did cover "Gimme Shelter" on the Survival album, pretty good. But that album's highlight is the haunting epic. I can see him in the morning. And yeah, that is 
Grand Funk has already had a all, always had a spiritual side. That's a Don Brewer tune there. Normally the spiritual content came from Mark, <clears throat> but I could see him in the morning as gospel, practically mm. beautiful. The there's um, Mary Clayton who was on Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah, is uncredited on this song, but she's singing those haunting background vocals on that song, and. Black licorice, man, that kicks ass. Black licorice. But, See, that's what I like. But I think I go back to, I can see him in the morning. The song opens up with interviews of a bunch of little kids and what is their concept about God. Mm -hmm. And then the last kid goes, uh, I think that there are a lot more bad people out there than good people. And that when you're bad, when you're good, you live forever, but when you're bad, you die when you die. You die when you die. And then it echoes. Blah, 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 blah. You die when you die. You die when you die. It's like really eerie. And then it comes into this whole gospel tune. Very different song. It seems like a lot of people are digging Dom Brewer here. Ernesto, oh, Black Cats, Licorice, Black Logan, Black Licorice. Licorice. Come on. That might be Can. what Dr. Funkenstein needs to check out if he wants a little introduction into the funk side of grand funk black licorice boom there you go okay so this is my thoughts because we've been on all, what time is it 752 all right this is the second album grand funk is one of those bands that improved over time this is an improvement over the first album the third album is an improvement over the second album the way i look at it Mm -hmm. I don't think the live album counts. I don't think that uh, the good doctor notes what you said. They improved. What was it? Robert Criscow mentioned that not many bands get a chance to put nine albums out in a row. And he mentioned that once they hit, we're an American band and shining on, he called shining on the best grand the best punk they album they ever did. Oh, and yeah. that is late in their career. Oh. Most bands don't have that type of track record. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Grand Funk improved over time. This is the second album. They have a ways to go. Yes, yes. it's kind of repetitive. I get too much mark. But the recording on this sounds great. I will give you that. I don't really have much use for the fuzz bass. But okay. But the album is very lively sounding. Obviously, they recorded this live in the studio. Mm -hmm. Does it sound like something from 1968? Does it sound like a poor man's version of Cream? Does yes. it sound like the poor man's version of... Uh, what's the one band that did... Uh, having a brain crisis, I can see it. Oh, God. You know. Uh, Blue Cheer. Blue Cheer. Okay. Is this a poor man's version of Blue Cheer? possibly yeah i do appreciate the energy the songs on here i guess are okay i don't know i think that they needed more of a producer someone to flesh these out um what's his name's not doing anything they threw him out on phoenix and i think things started to tighten up and get better we got craig frost in there yeah. once grand funk could start tooling their own career uh, I think everything changed. I think this is a fine second album for mm -hmm. a band that constantly improves. Okay. We're getting, you have, to, you have to tip your hat to the fact that they did not rest on their laurels. I think they actively tried to become a better and better band as they moved along. So uh, George said he loves born to die. DC and I looked at that last month. I thought Born to Die was fine. Yeah, I love that album. I think it gets a bad rap. I think all that later Grand Funk stuff is much better. Now, I'm, we're only talking about the Capital era. Things right. a bit, they changed a bit after they got off of Capital, you know. Right. Well, the band wasn't functioning, really. I don't think they were getting along. You know, we know Mark did his solo albums. Oh, and that reminds me. God darn it. Supposed to do those solo albums on Sea of Tranquility. God, I bet Pete forgot about that. Anyway, there's so much coming down the pike, ladies and gentlemen. Um, brain problem. 
but I think uh, Grand Funk improved over time. As a, a, for second album, I would give this. Would you give this an eight point five? Would you I give it an eight point five to my twenty twenty four ears? Younger DC would have rated this much higher, but as I sit today, I give it an eight point five. Still, I mean. I mean, Rolling Stone trashed this back in the day. I would probably give this uh, the live album I really disliked, and I gave that one like a three. <laughs> we can only go upward from there. I like this better than the live album. The live album, I did not. I no. Mm-hmm. This, I probably give it a, a six. I can give this a six. Fair enough. D, and like I've said, ladies and gentlemen, don't burn a cross in my yard or uh, uh, set my house on fire. <laughs> but I yeah. do think we're an American band and Shining On is top notch. I would rate those. Those are 10 out of 10. Those are 10s. So that's why this one for even me has to be an 8.5 because... A e pluribus, maybe a 10 as well. And then you've got some albums in between the red one and those 10s mm-hmm. where you're going to hit a couple nines. So. Right. So there you go. So you have to consider where I'm coming from. Hey, if DCI had, had never done this series, I would never have ever checked out Shining On oh. or Were American Band. And those I'm... records, I can put those on anytime now and listen to them all the way through. And I'm just amazed and love them. how and I'm thrilled I'm thrilled that those she records reached are. that point. And I think the important decision was to start with the Todd produced albums and then hit it right in the middle of their career and go from there while we're exploring this. But I was thrilled you loved the American band and shine it on. Oh, I love them. I was I was a little bit depressed that you hated that first live album so much because oh. before we recorded that. My toes were all curled up in my shoes thinking, oh, Grant is going to love this. That that Mel Shocker bass, it's going to blow his mind. Well, I it blew your mind for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I didn't care. No, not my, that's not my thing. That distorted fuzz bass, that's so dated. Not going to do it for you. Not going to do it. And a lot of the guitar <laughs> sounds on this are dated as well. Yeah. Ernesto says he rates this as an eight. For eight track approval. Of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Joyce Pete is with us, Logan. Ken W with us. Well, that's fine. Oh, look at you here, George. Rungren could produce anybody and make them sound amazing, and you always know it's his production work. True. Except, Except. on the grand funk stuff. I can't hear it. Grant, I can hear little Rungren isms as a wizard of two, a true star as he's added a little spacey tech to carry me through and some of the songs I'm shining on. In fact, the critic was bitching about his production back in the day said, Hey, grand Funk railroads from Flint, Michigan, not the crab nebula. <laughs> so I do hear a little spacey Todd isms on some of the stuff uh, I'm shining on, but I prog rock, dude, I have that bad Ooh, religion album. That's I do. Uh, well, I have, I got it, but I haven't listened to it. Prog Rock Dude. That is the one Rundgren production where I could not even listen to that album. That Bad really? Religion album he produced sucks. I can't even listen to one song. Awful. I haven't heard it. I've got it. Have to hear it. So uh, You are not going to like it if I know anything about you, but maybe I don't. Wait a minute, George says there's nothing like the late sixties and seventies production. It's so raw and fantastic. Well, yeah. It is. It is, but I think DC had a good point. Think about the records that came out at the same time. Killer came out around the same time, but it sounds way more advanced than Yeah, it just sounds the red album. Yeah. But it, yeah. it's all good. It's all Listen good. to what you love. Don't ever apologize for it. Yeah. And I think this is okay record. They're getting better. They're getting better. I guess the, the lead singer on Bad Religion was a huge Rundgren fanatic. Boy, you can't tell from listening to that album. There mm-hmm. is nothing that says Todd Rundgren on that album. God, look that one got, went got... right into the dumpster. I didn't look... even try and resell it. I slammed it in the garbage. We've got a lot of Facebook likes. Dave Lubin, 
Todd Evans, Mark Wolgen, Marco, and a lot of people watching right now. I do want to thank everybody for and, tuning and in. And again, folks, thank you for your awesome comments. They really spur the conversation on, and I so enjoy hearing and reading what everybody thinks. Yeah, so it's a lot of these shows are in good fun. Yeah, don't I'll get upset, folks. Hey, we're big boys and big girls in the warehouse. Someone doesn't like exactly what you want. You got to roll with it. Well, I got to be honest in this stuff. You got to be think, honest. That's what we want. We want honest reaction and opinion. And like I said, you have to hand it to Grand Funk. They improved over the time with each record. Yeah. Based on what I've seen, I haven't heard them all, but I do think that they've improved over time. And, you know, well, heck, you're all the girls in the world, beware, I think it's a fine record. You're pop rock. And that turned off a lot of the old time Grand Funk fans because they just looked at that album cover and didn't even give it a listen. But right. I love it. I was with this band for the whole ride yeah. and their different versions and the different directions they took in. I was agreeable with all of them. I liked all of them. So there but, you I mean, go. We've got about five or six of these albums we haven't touched yet. And there are some that I think deserve a full show. And there are a few of them I think we could just group them together. Okay, what, well, what we need one for real, real quick before we wrap it up. We, uh, still, we still have not touched Closer to Home, Survival, Phoenix. We kind of did American Band, but we really didn't. Well, that's um, kind of group. We could sing and good playing with Zappa. Well, give me what you want. I have, we could do. I would, I think we, we should tackle one of the earlier ones and then jump to Zappa. Why don't we do uh, Phoenix? Let's do Phoenix. Okay. It's, oh, I'm making a funny here. It's an odd bird in their catalog. Phoenix, All right. Rising Phoenix. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming on. Stay tuned for next month. We will be doing uh, Grand Funk Phoenix, for God's sakes. Yeah. And I'll be eagerly awaiting Pete Parter to reach out uh, about our episode about the uh, Point Counterpoint show on Grand Funk. So, I'll Boy, be that would be great. You two would go at it just like those two used to be on 60 Minutes. Like Siskel and Ebert. Oh, I'm looking yeah, forward to that. Off. So, yeah, next Maybe month is Phoenix. be a little bit too cordial, Grant. I think Pete may lay into you. I bring it on soul sister. That's how I look at it. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming on. Thanks for the chat. Thank you. Grant, and thanks for well, everybody. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, Linda Ronstadt premiere, John, the music nut. And I look at, uh, uh, hasten down the wind. And we look at simple dreams. We talk about those two records. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised when I saw that show up on my, uh, YouTube feed that you guys are going to be tackling that. That's we the did. Warehouse. Hey, we like all kinds of different stuff. Well, this is John. This is our second show in the series. And the last one we did was a year ago. We're just getting oh. around to the second one. All and right. Sunday night, everybody, the listening party, Steven Schnee will be back on the channel. We will be doing uh power pop. power pop the weekend after that. Ernesto will be in the house. Ooh. We will be doing LA. Ooh, the weekend nice. after that, we will have yet another Let There Be Rock. So get ready. There's a lot ready, going folks. on in the warehouse. So anyway, thank you, DC. We will see you on the next one. And everybody in the chat, thanks for coming on. We will see you later. Night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs>